4.2 analysis of functions part two relative extremely graphing polynomials so today we are going to graph you can think of a graph as having a relative maximum whenever you were at like a peak of a mountain might not be the highest mountain in the range but it's higher than its neighbors for instance this guy right here might not be the highest point on the graph, but if you look left and right in that neighborhood, it's still the highest point in that neighborhood. So we call this a relative maximum. By a similar definition, we have relative minimum. And we can have more than one relative maximum or relative minimum. We're going to learn later that that highest point is called the absolute maximum. And the lowest point is called the absolute minimum. So looking at some graphs that we're familiar with, you should be able to look at all of these graphs and identify all of the relative extrema. Extrema is just the plural for any maximum or minimum. So we see a local minimum. On this next graph, there's no maximum or minimum. The next one has a local maximum and a local minimum minimum, maximum, minimum. By the way, I use the word local and relative interchangeably. A local maximum is the same thing as a relative maximum. It means it's the maximum in that neighborhood. And cosine has all sorts of maxima and minima. So we've seen maxima and minima in all sorts of functions throughout our lives. And it turns out that a local maximum or minimum is going to happen at a critical point, which means a point where the derivative is zero or does not exist. So if we want to find the local maximum or minimum, first we find the critical points. And to do that, we find a derivative and set it equal to zero. So we get our derivative, we set it equal to zero, or undefined. And we get our two values in this case. If we look over at the graph itself, we can see that yes, at negative one and at positive one, we have local or relative extrema. We can find the y value of those extrema by plugging these x values into the original function, which we'll see by the time we're done today. So next up, find all critical points of this guy. Again, critical points happen when the derivative is zero or undefined. I recommend trying this on your own. Pause the video, see if you get the same thing I do. If you got stuck right around here, don't forget that you need to find a common denominator if you're going to try setting this equal to zero or undefined. Go ahead and pause and keep working. Caught myself on a mistake. This five thirds should have been a two thirds. Caught that. Good job. So we've got our derivative and we want to set this equal to zero or undefined. We can see that this is going to be zero whenever the top is zero. So we get a critical number at x equals two. We can also see that this is undefined when x equals zero because we can't divide by zero. So we get our two critical numbers. We've also got the graph of this on this slide. We can look at that and see that the critical numbers seem to tell us something. At x equals zero, we do have a local maximum. At x equals two, we do have a local minimum. So this kind of makes sense with what we're seeing. Next up is the first derivative test. What the first derivative test basically tells us is that we have a local 
or relative extreme anytime the slope changes sign. So we can see here the slope goes from positive to negative, we have a maximum. Slope goes from positive to negative, a maximum, and so on. If the slope goes from positive to zero to positive, that's not a max or a min. Negative to negative, no max or min. Positive to positive, no max or min. So we're going to look back at the previous example and find the local maxima and minima using the first derivative test. So if you recall from that previous example, our derivative was this guy. And our critical numbers were 0 and 2. So we're going to set up intervals and test those intervals. If my splitting points are 0 and 2, I can make intervals that go from negative infinity to 0, 0 to 2, 2 to infinity. Now I just want to plug numbers into all of these and find out if my function is increasing or decreasing on these intervals. A nice number from negative infinity to 0, maybe negative 27, positive 1. 235. Doesn't really matter what numbers we choose. Plugging these into the derivative, plugging in a negative 27, I see pretty quickly I get a negative on top and a negative on bottom. So this whole thing is positive, which means we're increasing on the interval. Plug in 1, I see I get a negative over a positive. Negative. So I'm decreasing on the interval. And from 2 to infinity, I plug in a big number, I get a positive over a positive. So I must be increasing on the interval. That little chart tells me that from at zero, I go from increasing to decreasing. So imagine what that looks like, increasing to decreasing. I have a maximum at x equals zero. Don't know what the y value is yet. From at x equals two, I go from their max. At x equals 2, I go from decreasing to increasing, so I must have a minimum, a local or relative minimum. I don't know what the y value is. To get my y values, I have to plug these x values into the original function. Not into the derivative, because we'll either get 0 or undefined. But I plug into the original function. Plug in 0, I see I get 0. Plug in 2. We get a less nice number. Fortunately, we don't have to figure out what that number is right now because all it asked us to do in the problem was to verify that there is a minimum. And we did using the first derivative test. We can also verify it in the picture, maximum, minimum. A big part of what we're going to be doing in this chapter is putting all of this together into one big graph. So we also have a second derivative test. And the second derivative test kind of tells us something common sense. Part A says if the slope is 0 and we're concave up, like right there, we must have a minimum. If the slope is 0 but we're concave down, we must have a maximum. If the slope is 0 and the second derivative is 0, meaning we have an inflection point. That wasn't a very good picture. The slope doesn't look like it's zero. Maybe closer to something like that. Second derivative test doesn't tell us anything. We don't necessarily have a maximum or a minimum. We might, but we don't know. So we're going to find the relative extrema of this guy, and we're going to try to use the second derivative test. So first we need to find out where the first derivative is equal to zero. Factor out our 15x squared. Factor completely. And find our critical numbers. 
Next up, we can plug these numbers into the second derivative. If we get a negative output, that means we had a concave down, therefore a maximum. If we plug these numbers into the second derivative, we get a positive value. That means we're concave up, so we must have a minimum. Either way, we need the second derivative, which is easy enough to get. Might as well factor that. Now we can plug these various numbers in. Plug in our first critical number, 0, and we get 0. Unfortunately, that's inconclusive. That's unfortunate. Plug in our next critical number, which is the second derivative. We see we get a negative times a positive. So this must be a negative. I don't even care what number it is. Since we're concave down, we must have a maximum. At positive 1, plug in positive 1, we get a positive times a positive. I don't care what number that is exactly, I just know that it's a positive. It means I'm concave up, which means I must have a minimum. Notice 0 was inconclusive. We might have a max, we might have a min, we might have neither. Unfortunately, we have to go back to the first derivative test to try that out. And, of course, you could have used the first derivative test for the whole thing. second derivative test is just a little easier when it works. So going back towards 0, we have to make the intervals that matter. We don't care about negative infinity to negative 1. We care about negative 1 to 0, 0 to 1. We don't care about 1 to infinity either. The only number that we had problems was with 0, so we only have to look at what's going on at zero. So maybe some easy numbers to plug into our first derivative. We negative one half and one half. I find out my f of negative one half. Got to be careful and plug that into the derivative. That's this guy up here. Plugging in a negative one half gives us a positive times a positive times a negative. So. I don't care what that exact number is. I know that it is less than 0. So I'm decreasing on that interval. Plugging in my positive 1 half into the first derivative. I get a positive times a positive times a negative. So I'm decreasing on that interval. Since I'm decreasing on these two intervals, I don't have a maximum or a minimum at 0. The only maximum and minimums I get are right at negative 1 and 1. To find the y value, we would plug those values into the original function. Let's look at the graph up here and see everything that we just found out. We found out that there was a maximum at negative 1. We can see that there. There is a minimum at positive 1. We can see that there. And at 0, we don't have a maximum or a minimum, but we did have a zero slope and an inflection point. We know it's a zero slope from the first derivative. We know it's an inflection point because concavity changed. So you can see these problems are starting to get involved. Last problem, and it is a doozy. So sketch the graph of this equation, identify locations of the intercepts, relative extrema, and inflection points. Intercepts is a case of not calculus. So we should know how to do this from algebra 2 and pre-cal. We find x-intercepts by factoring. We find y-intercepts by plugging in 0 for x. Unfortunately, when you look at this, you might realize this does not factor nicely. It doesn't work with grouping. We can't use Clinton magic. We have to use the PQ rational root theorem. Fortunately, there's not too many things to try. So just for fun, let's try positive 1. 
don't remember how to use synthetic division, come talk to me. Or Miss Collins. And hey, what do you know? One worked. It's like I knew. So we factor this and we have x minus 1 times x squared plus x minus 2, which also factors nicely. So after doing all that factoring, we know the x-intercepts are at 1, negative 2, and 1 again. Since 1 shows up twice, we get to say that 1 has a multiplicity of 2. Hopefully you remember that means that the graph bounces at 1. Y-intercept is a little easier. Just plug in 0 for x. And we get 2. And in pre-cal and algebra 2, kind of, that's all we did. We just used that plus the end behavior to sketch a graph. We didn't worry about where the peaks and valleys were at. But now in calculus, we get to find those peaks and valleys, which we call relative extrema. So to find those peaks and valleys, first we have to find the critical numbers, which means we set the first derivative equal to 0. And we end up with two critical numbers. To find out increasing and decreasing behavior at these numbers, we have to make our intervals. Negative infinity and negative 1, negative 1 to 1, 1 to infinity. Choose some nice numbers. Doesn't really matter. Plug those into the derivative. So I'm plugging numbers into the derivative. Plugging in a negative 2, I see I get a positive times a negative times a negative. Positive. Plug in 0, get a positive times a positive times a negative. Plug in 2, all positives. So I can see that I am increasing, decreasing, and increasing, which implies that I have a max at negative 1, comma something, and a min at one comma something. To figure out those somethings, you have to plug back into the original equation. Not into the derivative, you'll just get zero. You've got to plug into the original equation. And doing that, we get four and zero. You can verify that on your own. We're not done yet. We also have to find the inflection points check for concavity. That's a second derivative issue. So we find our second derivative. It's kind of a nice one. The only critical number is 0. Make our intervals. Plug in a number from each interval. Doesn't really matter what. Plug it into the second derivative. We see we get a negative and a positive. Concave down, concave up. So we have an inflection point right where the concavity changes. Happens at zero, so that point is zero comma. We should know where to plug that into by now. Not the second derivative, not the first derivative, but the original. Plug in zero to the original, we get two. Now we're ready to put all this together into one beautiful, majestic graph. can imagine how fun these graphs are to grade. First thing I'm going to do is put in my x-intercepts, which were at negative 2 and positive 1. I can put in my y-intercept at 2. Next, maybe the points that were important, like my maximum at negative 1, 4. And since it's a maximum, I'm just going to put a little bump there to remind myself. I have a minimum at 1, 0. Put a little bump there to remind myself, too. And I have an inflection point at 0, 2, which means I need to change concavity. That point's already on the graph. Everything else kind of falls into place. I can put my arrow down. 
as I'm going down towards that point of inflection, I need to change concavity right then. And we get our graph. Things I will be grading. I'll be checking, did you tell me the, do you have the correct areas that the graph is increasing? Do you have the correct areas that the graph is decreasing? Do you have all of your maxima and minima labeled? Do you have your intercepts in the right place? And do you have your point of inflection in the right place? All that stuff needs to be in the graph. These are monster problems. On the bright side, this one won't seem bad at all compared to 4.3. And on that note, go ahead and do your click check exercises. Good luck. Have a wonderful day.